Let's open this morning's service with hymn number 62 from your heart back hymnal, 662, number 62. Crown him with many crowns. Let's all stand together. Is our prayer this morning, isn't it? The Lord would enable us to worship Him in the power of His Spirit and according to the truth of His Word, worshiping Him from the heart. Uh, we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 15. If you'd like to open your Bibles with me to that passage, Proverbs chapter 15. I've titled this message. The power of words, the power of words. Words are very powerful. <clears throat> Let's uh, pray together and ask the Lord's blessings. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've put it into our hearts to, to worship you, to have a desire to know you, to exalt you. Lord, you said that if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And so, Lord, we pray that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so might the Son of Man be lifted up in our hearts this morning. Might we be blessed with your favor and your grace to look upon him in faith and be healed from the venomous bite of sin. Lord, we come before your throne of grace confessing that we are sinners and, oh Lord, what great hope we have in that one who is sinless, 
harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Lord, cause us to find our rest and our hope in him and give us the faith to believe thy word. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. In Matthew, I think it's in chapter 11, the Lord, the disciples asked the Lord, why do you speak to them in parables? And the Lord answered that question by saying to them, because it's not for them to know the mystery of the kingdom. But it is for you to know. And the disciples responded by essentially saying, but Lord, we don't understand the parables either. (laughs) And so uh, the Lord took them aside and taught them the meaning of the parables. And then further on in that passage, the scripture says, and he taught them nothing but by parables. Much of the scripture is written by way of parables. And unless the Lord takes us aside and enables us to understand the spiritual meaning of these parables, the gospel meaning of these parables, then we'll be just like everybody else. We'll only understand the surface meaning and uh, and never see the glory of Christ in them. In Proverbs chapter 15, the Lord begins this... Proverb, which is a parable. By the way, the word parable and proverb means the same thing. And, uh, you know, I was thinking that even politicians who have no interest whatsoever in the gospel know that if they lose their temper in public, they will lose all confidence of the people. Basically, their careers will be ruined because... Losing your temper, raising your voice, becoming angry is a sign of weakness. It's a sign of weakness. It's a desperate attempt to get control of a situation that you feel like you're losing control of. And and that's true in every area of life, isn't it? And so this parable begins by saying, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. I pray the Lord will teach us that lesson. It is true that uh, that uh, those who holler the loudest and and uh, and and are the biggest uh, sometimes they win a battle, but in the end they lose a war, don't they? Sometimes they may score a point, but they'll lose a game. And uh, might God give us the grace to have the wisdom to, uh, to not be that way. But there's a gospel meaning here that goes far beyond the practical application, if you will, to our personal lives. And uh, I, I hate putting it that way because there's really nothing more practical than the gospel. And there's nothing more personal than the gospel. But you understand what I mean. Um, the, re- the, the, the understanding of this passage where the Lord explains to his disciples, no, I don't ever raise my voice. I don't need to. I'm not out of control. <laughs> I'm, I, 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 I've got, I, I'm not threatened by anything or by anybody. And I don't raise my voice in the streets. I don't have to, I don't have to beat my children. Um, I speak to them with a soft voice. Remember when the prophet Elijah went up on the mountain and, and uh, he heard a whirlwind? He was, he was running from Jezebel and desperate to have the Lord speak to him, wasn't he? And one of the significant things of that story is that the prophet ran to Mount Sinai. <laughs> and the first question that the Lord asked him, he said, he said Elijah, why are you here? Why would you run back to the law in order to try to get some comfort, some protection? There is no protection in the law. And there was a whirlwind, and the Lord's voice was not in it. And then there was an earthquake, and the Lord's voice was not in it. There was a fire, and the Lord's voice was not in it. All these tremendous uh, 
uh, demonstrations of power. And then what happened? The Lord spoke with a still small voice and he calmed Elijah's heart and he sent him back with confidence. That's how the Lord speaks. That's how he speaks. When he speaks, he speaks effectually to our hearts. He convinces us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. He converts us by his word, doesn't he? By his own will begat he us with the word of truth. <laughs> you know, it's a miracle of God's grace that we have rested all the hope of our immortal soul on words, on words. We weren't there. You weren't there. Now, Peter was there. He said, he said, I did not bring to you cunningly devised fables, but we handled the word of truth. <laughs> we handled the word of God. We know that what we say is true, but that's the testimony of a man, isn't it? It's the testimony of a man. Someone who says they've seen or heard audibly from God since the Lord Jesus Christ ascended back into glory is a liar. God speaks to the hearts of his people by his word. And Peter goes on to say, and we have a more sure testimony, a more sure word of truth. He's speaking of the word of God. He says, take heed, take heed that you believe. To rest the hope of our salvation on words, on the testimony of another. Now, if you served as a juror in a court of law, you would have to listen to the testimony of different witnesses and then decide for yourself the veracity of those testimonies. And the defending uh, attorney would be trying to discredit the testimony of the prosecutor and vice versa, wouldn't you? And you'd have to sit there as a juror and try to figure out what the truth was. When God speaks, we just believe. We believe everything he says. His word is sharp, Hebrews chapter 4. Powerful, powerful. Sharper than any double-edged sword, able to divide asunder the soul and the spirit and reveal the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's the word of God. There's no word like that. Remember when they, sent the, when they sent them out to arrest the Lord and they came back without him and they said, where is he? What those, what those arresting officers say to the Pharisees? Never a man spake like this man before. <laughs> we couldn't defend him. We couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't take a, a hold of him. His words were too powerful. And he is the word of God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And the word is God. And the word became flesh. And he dwelt among us. And we beheld. We beheld his glory as the only begotten of the father. The one who is himself full of grace. And full of what? Truth. Truth Lord. And what that centurion say? No you read it in the study this morning. When the Lord said, I'll come and heal your servant. The centurion said, I'm not worthy that thou should come under my roof. Only speak the word and my servant shall be healed. <laughs> Lord, I'm a man under authority. I understand authority. I say unto this man, go, and he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. I understand that you have all authority. And when the Lord ascended back into glory, that's what he said. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, you go. Go. And I'll be with you, even until the end of the earth. There's, there's no words like these words, is there? And so when God says, a soft answer turneth away wrath, you and I come into this world with our fist clenched against God. We are, the scripture says we are at enmity with God. We will not have this man reign over us. I'm going to do it my way. I'm, going to, I'm the captain of my own ship. I'm the master of my own destiny. I'll make my own decisions. And if I get in trouble, I'll call on God to help me out. But I'm going to be the one calling the shots. 
That's how we come into this world. That's the attitude that we have. And the Lord says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. <laughs> I'll speak to them. And the Lord himself said, they shall be all taught of God. When God teaches you, just believe everything God says, don't you? Everything. You believe it all. Every word of it. Understand it all? No. But believe it? Yes. <laughs> yes. Now his voice, though be soft, though it be soft, is not weak. It's not weak. It's powerful. Scripture says his voice is at the sound of many waters. That's a picture of a waterfall. You're standing at the, at the edge of this great waterfall and you're not able to carry on a conversation with the person next to you because of the sound of this water. It's deafening to everything else. And so it is. When that still small voice speaks, when the soft answer that turneth away wrath speaks effectually to our hearts, it's the only voice we can hear. All other voices are drowned out, aren't they? No one else's opinion. No one else's ideas can change what you've heard once you've heard the Lord's word. Once you've heard the gospel of his free grace. Once he's convinced you that you're a sinner. You have no righteousness of yourself. You're completely dependent upon him as your sin bearer, as your substitute, as your sacrifice before God. And that he was successful. <laughs> he was successful in actually accomplishing the redemption of those that God chose in the covenant of grace before the world ever began. That's a soft answer, isn't it? You just believe it. I love when the Lord said to Isaiah, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Speak ye comfortably to them. Speak from my heart to your heart to their hearts. We don't have to beat the sheep, do we? You know, it was a generation or two ago, if you weren't screaming and hollering, you weren't preaching. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. Because God's word doesn't have to be. I mean, we ought to speak passionately. We ought to speak from our hearts. But men don't have to be intimidated. The Lord never intimidates anybody. Not, and not his children. Let me rephrase that. The Lord never intimidates his children. Everyone else is intimidated by him. <laughs> but he doesn't intimidate his children. Look at, uh, look at Proverbs chapter 11. It's not the wrath of God that leads us to repentance. It's the goodness of God that leadeth to repentance. It's the love of Christ that constraineth us. And he doesn't convince us of his love with a loud voice. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. Now you can look it up. Proverbs 11, verse 3. I'm sorry, did I say something different? Uh, Proverbs 11, verse 3. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. Now that word integrity is the word innocence. Innocence. Those for whom Christ died. Those that God chose according to his own will and purpose in the covenant of grace before the world ever began. Those who have heard his voice and followed him are innocent. Innocent justified before God they are without sin there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus the law has nothing to say to God's people the law has been satisfied Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth let me ask you a question child of God what is it that breaks your heart and motivates you to want to serve God and obey God more the threats of the law or the soft answer that turneth away wrath? 
It's the love of Christ that constraineth us, isn't it? It's not the fear of wrath. It's knowing that the wrath of God has been silenced by the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus Christ made for you. (laughs) We mourn after him as one mourneth for his own son, the one whom we have pierced. That's, that's, the, that's the soft answer, isn't it? Lord, let me hear thy still small voice. Speak tenderly and softly to my heart and convince me. Convince me. Break me. <laughs> when the Lord breaks his children, he doesn't break them with a rod. A rod of iron. <laughs> he breaks them with his grace, doesn't he? You see, that's the meaning of these parables. And if we're looking to his soft answer, by his grace, he will enable us to have soft answers. You know, how many times we've tried to fight fire with fire, and what what happens when you fight fire with fire? What happens? The fire gets bigger, doesn't it? (laughs) The fire gets bigger. There's only one time in the history of mankind when fire beat fire. And that's when the fire of God's wrath fell from heaven on the sinner's substitute and satisfied all the demands of God's justice so that we now have no fear of the fire. The threats of hell Fire's been quenched. You've heard the story of the man who's, uh, who's traveling with his family out west, and, and uh, there's one of these western states where the, where the grass is six feet tall, and there's a great fire coming their way. The, the plains are on fire. And if the fire catches them, uh, they'll all perish in it. And so the father gathers his his family around and he starts a fire right there where they are. (laughs) And the fire burns out this large circle around his family. And the children are crying. They see the fire coming and they say, Father, Father, is the fire going to kill us? And the father says, No, my child. The fire can never burn again where it's already burned once. The fire of God's rest justice can never bear, burn again where it's already burned once. Child of God, the Lord speaks with a still small voice. The Lord speaks with a soft answer to turn away wrath. Grievous words, they just stir up anger, don't they? <laughs> and they stir up anger in our hearts. If we hear, if we hear another voice and it's been told us that that's the voice of God but that voice is speaking with anger and with judgment and with wrath what does that cause us to do causes us to run from God and God asked Adam Adam where art thou Lord knew where Adam was (laughs) he didn't have to holler Hear my Lord. Soft answer turneth away wrath. The tongue of the wise, verse 2. This is the the parable. What's the Lord doing? I hope what he's doing right now is he's taking his people aside. And he, I hope you're not just hearing my voice. If you just hear the voice of a man, you'll never be taught of God. But if what I'm saying is true... And the Lord convinces our hearts that this is true. Then we've been taught of God. And the parable, like I said, the the unbeliever. And we spent, many of us spent years in religion studying this book. And all we saw was the surface meaning. And we thought, well, if we could just put into practice these principles, these precepts, then we can earn favor with God by our own righteousness. Isn't that what we thought? 
Are these precepts true? Will they make life easier? Yeah. Yeah. But oh, there's so much more to them, isn't there? This book's about Christ. It's about Christ. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. <laughs> what did uh, Samuel say when Eli told him, well, the Lord was speaking to Samuel, and, 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 and Eli said, next time you hear his voice, say, thy servant listeneth. Speak, Lord. And that's what, that's what Samuel said. Speak, Lord, for thy servant listeneth. Lord, I, my, my ears are tuned. Lord, what, whatever, whatever you have to say, I want to hear it. I want to hear from you. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. <laughs> oh, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of the gospel is spoken effectually to our hearts by the tongue of the man who is wise. God has made him to be for us all our wisdom and all our righteousness and all of our sanctification and all of our redemption. The personification of, uh, of wisdom in the Proverbs in particular is a, is a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. This book's about him. He's the one who takes the knowledge of God and speaks it aright to our hearts so that we know him. Lots of lies being told. Lots of lies being told. We're going to look at that in the next hour. Many false prophets have gone into the world. What did John say? Try the spirits to see whether they be of God. Are they speaking the truth? <laughs> are they speaking the truth from God's word? Or are they speaking lies? Lies, lies, sweet little lies. Everybody loves to hear lies, don't they? And they believe the lie. And the biggest lie that men believe today is that man has a free will. <laughs> That's the biggest lie. Man has a free will. I, I, I determine the destiny of my own soul by a decision that I make. God turned them over to a reprobate mind because they had no love for the truth. He sent them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Men believe the lie. They believe they have a free will. They believe they decide for themselves. Who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved? They've taken God off the throne. They've put themselves on the throne of God, haven't they? The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. <laughs> now, we can see our own selves in these, in these things, can't we? Uh, how many times our mouths have spilled out foolishness? His mouth never did. Never has and never will. Never. Everything he says is true. You can trust his word for your soul and for your life. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Nothing that goes beyond his sight. Proverbs, chapter, uh, Psalm 139, he knows our ways. He knows our comings and our goings. He knows our thoughts before we think them. In the words that we speak, he knows them before we speak them. Our God is omniscient. Now, that's only a threat. That's only a threat to those who are not trusting Christ. To those who are trusting Christ, that's a great comfort. That's a great comfort. Let me show you that. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. The Lord's not, the Lord's not threatening his children. You know, remember he speaks with a soft answer. <laughs> That's how he, he woos us to himself. <laughs> he doesn't beat his sheep. He doesn't try to intimidate his sheep. He loves them. And it is the love of Christ that constraineth us. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. At verse, uh, verse 12, for the word of God is quick 
It is quick. Is it a miracle that the first time you heard the gospel, you believed it? If you haven't believed it, you haven't heard it. But as soon as you hear it, you just believe it. <laughs> you believe the testimony, don't you? It's quick. It's powerful. When God speaks, he leaves you with no options. And you've heard me say this before. I'm going to say it again. Coming to Christ is not a choice. It is not a choice. Because when God convinces you of the truth, you've got no place else to go. You're just bound by his word. It's quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Oh, Lord, my thoughts are so vain. My intents and my purposes are so sinful. And the word of God reveals that, doesn't he? And then he says, your thoughts are not like my thoughts. Your ways are not like my ways. As the heaven is high above the earth, so are my thoughts above yours. And I know the thoughts that I have for you. Thoughts of good. Thoughts of peace. Not of evil. To bring you to your expected end. Now look at verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, I'm going to say something that applies to every person in this room, every person that might hear the sound of my voice. Every person's going to have to do with God. And the fear of God in the hearts of God's people is the thought of standing in the presence of a holy God without the Lord Jesus Christ pleading your cause. Without the righteousness of Christ as all your hope. But oh, when you know that you have him then there's peace, isn't there? The Prince of Peace. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing then, <laughs> verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. You see, fear the spirit of fear is not of God. In other words, you know, I, I've always thought of that as, you know, if I'm fearful, that didn't come from God. But it means something else. God doesn't use fear to control his people. He doesn't have to. That's the tactics of a person who's losing control. <laughs> Our God hasn't lost control. The spirit of fear is not of God, but of love, of a sound mind. <laughs> For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. You see, it's the love of Christ that causes us to run to him. It's fear that causes us to run away from him. Why did Adam hide? Why did he hide? He was afraid. He was afraid. Why did Gideon hide? <laughs> Why was he hiding down in the wine press? He was afraid. Fear will cause you to run from God. This whole thing. I, there's no creature that's not manifest in his presence, and that's what caused... Go back with me to our text. Verse 3 of Proverbs chapter 15. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, <clears throat> beholding the evil and the good. Our God has nothing but compassion for his children. His wrath, his justice, the fire of his ju judgment is already spent. It's already spent. Seeing that we have such a high priest, come, come boldly, come with confidence to the throne of grace that you might find help in your time of need. What is your need? 
I know what it is. Now, we all have temporal problems that we have to deal with in this life. But we all have the same need when it comes to the salvation of our souls. We have a need for a Savior. We have a need for a substitute. We have a need to have our sins put away, don't we? <laughs> we have a need to be saved. That's our need. That's our greatest need. Every other need. And I'm going to say something I've also said many times. <laughs> Any problem that you can solve with time or money is not really the problem we're talking about here. And there's only one problem that you can't solve with time or money. Only one. Every other problem that you and I experience in this world is going to be solved either by money or by time. Because when you take your last breath, you're not going to have any more problems. Oh, but that sin problem, we can't buy our way out of it. And all of eternity in hell won't solve it, will it? The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Come to my throne of grace. <laughs> you find help in your time of need. Mercy and grace. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. <laughs> oh, Lord, give me a wholesome tongue. Let me speak a word in due season. Lord, put a guard on my lips. And James talks about that, doesn't he? James talks about this, this fire of iniquity that's in our mouths. <laughs> and the unruly tongue that no man can tame is what James says. And that's true. You can't tame your own tongue. But he can. He can. Lord, tame my tongue. Put a guard over my lips. Keep me from... from, from from speaking fiery words of wrath that are going to just stir up dissension among men. But more importantly, Lord, your tongue is wholesome. <laughs> your tongue speaks of the tree of life. <laughs> the tree of life, that's that tree that Adam was, was exiled from in the garden, wasn't he? Let us put a seraphim over the gates of paradise lest they go back in and eat of the tree of life and then we see that tree of life where again we see it in revelation don't we planted by the river of life producing its fruit in due season 12, 12, 12 fruits every year it's always a different fruit on the tree and, and the people of God and the leaves of the tree of life were for the healing of the nations that tree of life was Christ and everything the Lord Jesus Christ says he says about himself He's the teacher and he's the subject. <laughs> he always speaks of himself, doesn't he? A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach to the spirit. If it's not speaking of Christ, it doesn't comfort my spirit. It doesn't give me hope. Tell me about him. What did Paul say? We preach Christ and him crucified. And we profess to know nothing else among you save Jesus and him crucified. He's the one we need, isn't he? The power of words. Wars have been started over words. Broken marriages have happened over words. Children have been estranged from their parents over words, haven't they? Words are powerful. Lord, give me, give me grace to guard my words. But there is no power to your word or my word like there is to his word. <laughs> Lord, speak your word. And my servant shall be healed. All right, let's take a break.